In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. They tried. They really tried hard to get the job done right. Judas's insider information about where Jesus would be that night, the well-choreographed trial set up by the priests, the public pressure put on Pilate to put Jesus to death. It's tough to see how hard you could really improve on that. Of course, the Roman soldiers knew exactly what to do. They had had plenty of practice. And really, how hard is it to drive three nails in and hoist a person up? And when somebody stops breathing and goes as limp as a rag doll, that's usually a good sign they're dead, which Jesus was. But it just didn't work out at least not for long, because when you go up against the God of all creation, prepare to be disappointed in your endeavor. Because no matter how hard you try, you are going down. <laughs> this is the God who made palm fronds. We played with those last week. The God who made iron fashioned into nails. A God who made people created in his own image. As Genesis reveals, everything exists because God said so. To borrow from the Beatles, and feel free to sing along if you like. Let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. And whatever God said after that happened. And this was not a one-off event that went on for six solar days. Over the course of billions of years, God has kept creating time and stars and grains of sand. Even now, God is singing your name. God is singing your name because He loves you. Because He enjoys you. And because if God stopped singing our names, we wouldn't die, we'd just disappear. Because the voice of God is all that holds us in being. To create order from chaos, light from darkness, beauty out of nothingness, that is real power. That is glory. And the people who thought they could shut that down with a cross really needed to think again. The cross was beyond awful. And Jesus has earned our everlasting thanks for the sacrifice of suffering he offered there for our sake. But the people who nailed Jesus down actually lifted him up. What they thought was going to be permanent turned out only to be temporary. And far from a setback, they ironically and unwittingly helped God emerge victorious over death by putting Jesus to death. They unwittingly helped God bring new life into creation and hope for the restoration and redemption and reconciliation of all creatures including us, to God. But when dawn broke on the third day, the people who worked so hard to get Jesus killed were feeling pretty good about themselves. Best Passover ever. I mean, they had won. For the disciples, though, the past few days had been the worst in their lives. Neither group of people seems to have been aware that the man who died was also the very same divine word that created all things. The divine word 
let it be who sings the name of every living creature. Neither group knew. So Mary Magdalene set out before dawn to mourn at the tomb in the garden. Imagine how horrific it was for her to find the stone missing. Who could have done that? Why? Grave robbers? Someone who thought that death wasn't enough and they needed to steal Jesus' body and desecrate it? Who knows what was running through Mary's mind as she raced back to the disciples, breathless. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So that got Simon Peter and the other disciple, who never gets a name, sprinting off to the garden. Jesus sings his name, we just don't know what it is. Off to the garden they go, hoping that Mary had made a mistake. It was dark out. Maybe she got confused and went to the wrong tomb. But their worst fears were confirmed when they leaned inside the tomb and only saw linen, the linen that had wrapped the body of Jesus. He was gone. So they left. They left for home. What else could they possibly do, really? But Mary Magdalene stayed. She wasn't ready to go yet. As she wept, Mary took another look, and inside she saw two angels seated on the shelf where they'd laid the body of Jesus. And they asked her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, and, and we can imagine her voice choking, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. To be honest, I'm a little disappointed with the angels because their response to her was silence. The word angel literally translates as messenger. So they really fell down on the job. They could have said, he's alive. Don't you remember what he told you? But they offered no words of comfort or hope, no grand revelation that Christ is risen. So Mary turned away and saw a man she mistook for the gardener who asked her the same question the angels did plus one more, whom are you looking for? Assuming that maybe this man had something to do with what was going on, that he might be one of the they she blamed for taking Jesus away, she pleaded. She begged tell me where he is tell me I'll do anything he means everything to me he changed my life he saved me and then Jesus called her by name and through eyes blurred with tears she saw her Savior can you imagine that the shock the ecstasy the sheer joy of that moment. Jesus had not been desecrated, but liberated from the grave, freed from the power of death. All she wanted to do was embrace him and never let go. But Jesus told her, don't hold on to me, but go. She had a message to deliver. And unlike the silent angels in the tomb, nothing was going to keep Mary quiet. Because the tomb was empty, and that opening in the stone unleashed the divine word of life. A new creation full of unbelievable possibilities. Jesus had returned full of glory, so transformed that at first Mary didn't even recognize him until... She heard his voice calling her by name. The oracle, 
that God spoke through the prophet Isaiah had been fulfilled in a way that no one had foreseen. I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice. So the very first witness to the resurrection, the one who waited at the tomb after the others had gone home, ran with an energy she probably never felt before. Her heart was bursting, just bursting to share what she'd learned. For the moment, that's where the story leaves us. But if you'd like to hear the subsequent uh, episodes, you can come back next Sunday and Sunday after that. <laughs> it's hard for us, isn't it, to, to summon the sort of excitement that, that Mary had. She had a unique experience, and most of us grew up with this story, and even those of us who didn't uh, have come to know it well. Every year we gather to celebrate and praise this most wondrous event in the history of the universe our God created, and that is why we worship to gather together, to sing and pray, to hear scripture and share in the bread and wine is an opportunity to relive holy moments and allow them to enter our hearts and minds anew. And we do it because we, we need to. We desperately need to. So often, we can feel powerless, or afraid, or alienated. People feel exploited and abused, broken, and we cry out for help, for relief, rescue, and we're far from alone. We can feel like the disciples after the crucifixion, disappointed, abandoned by God, with no hope for the future or clear sense of purpose. So many others feel the same way. Now, the power of the resurrection rarely fixes any of that in the blink of an eye. It would be wonderful if it did, but the reality is the greatest pains in life cannot be fixed. There's more to it than that. And the resurrection is so much more than a fix. Jesus risen is the inauguration of a new reality a reality in which the days of evil are numbered. And the faster we run to spread the good news, the faster that number will be counted down to zero. If Jesus can defeat death itself, evil doesn't stand a chance. So we who know the story need to share it without shame. The word of life sings our names endlessly. We need to sing the praises of Jesus without ceasing, and not just in this particular building. And beyond words, and words are very powerful, there is a witness to be offered in the priorities that we set in our lives in how we treat other people with kindness and conduct our lives with dignity and integrity. Not like the people who join the screaming mobs. But perhaps most of all, there is a singular likeness of being a lightness of being which is the peace 
that arrives when the resurrection lives in us. I've been thinking about that a lot lately, especially this past week. It's been busy, but even when life around here is pretty much at its normal speed, I can get focused to a fault. And I tend to move quickly, a human blur that sometimes misses things that need to be seen and heard. Don't pretend that you haven't noticed. Now that type of energy may reveal something about the intensity of the resurrection power of Jesus. After all, there was a whole lot of running going on on the morning of the crucifixion. And sometimes Jesus needs us, swift and nimble. But my Lenten discipline, and I almost share that with nobody, has been to focus on slowing down, to focus on waiting by the empty tomb like Mary did, and learning to walk like Cary Grant. <laughs> Seriously. Look him up on YouTube if you've never seen any of his movies. Hey, you know, watch a three or four minute clip. The man just glides. He just glides as if he doesn't have a care or a worry in the world. And part of me suspects that when Jesus exited the tomb into the garden, he was moving with even greater elegance than Cary Grant. Now that's just me. It's up to you to figure out what it's going to be. What it would mean for that lightness of being to be expressed through you so that people can know Christ risen. Figuring out what that is for you takes some work. And a good place to start is to ask yourself, whom am I looking for? And where am I looking? Because Jesus likes to pop up in unexpected places. The last places we would look, and it's easy not to recognize him at first when he comes in the form of a refugee or a homeless person or when he is present yet hidden in fracturing relationships and even in the proud person desperately trying to hide their insecurities. When we can accept the gardener or whoever just might be Jesus and then offer grace and the mercy of forgiveness to the person that we like the least. Maybe even to the person who has hurt us the most. We are proclaiming the risen Christ and his power and every time we do, the opportunity arises that the peace we so desire, the peace that comes from the presence of Jesus can be released through us into the world. You don't need me to tell you about how the world is. Silly, superficial, mean. And those are the three nicest things I can say about what's happening out there in terms of the stuff we got to work on. There are wonderful things as well. But every day we have to live with lies and cruelty. This bottomless cauldron of sin and misery and the world needs hope. Every single last one of us needs hope. The world needs the prospect of joy in troubled times, to know that the future belongs to God. People need to see and hear and know that Christ is alive. Transformed by God's glory, people need to know just as we do that God is singing their name because he loves them. And people need to know that nothing 
Nothing can take the Lord away. Nothing can nail him down. And there is nothing that will put him into a dark and empty hole. Not anymore. And never again. <laughs>